Well, since it's quiet, I can feel the silence. <laughs> I, I welcome you today. Today, um, I've, told, I've said this before, but when we, we, I turned the corner uh, just a, a couple blocks from our house, I, I can look across uh, Lake Arbor and, and I see Mount Evans up there. And when I see that, I, it just always goes through my heart and mind, how great thou art, right? Uh, I look to the hell, hills, from where does my help come? My help uh, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. If he can make that mountain, he can take care of my little molehills, right? <laughs> All right, and so today we come and we can rest in God's uh, grace and mercy knowing that we have a creator God who made all of that, a creator God that loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to be our savior, that he loves us that much, that he wants to spend eternity with us. And uh, so I pray that the Lord will bless you today, that he will give you this day of rest that will carry you through the week, and that you will be blessed in all that we do and, and say here as we experience uh, Christ's um, word or God's word as spoken and the sacraments that he gives to us. So today I would uh, like to invite you, if you wouldn't mind, filling out the cards in the pew rack in front of you, letting us know that you're here. And if there is a ministry need or a prayer request that we can help you with, please include that on the card. And uh, we do take those seriously. We do pray for you during the course of the week. And it's our honor and pleasure to be able to do that. For those of you that are joining us online, I'd like to welcome you too. We have a God who is great and transcends space and time. And so I know whenever it is that you're watching this, that you will be blessed as well because these are God's gifts coming to you. And if you have any ministry needs or prayer requests, please call the church office. And when you hear the voice message hit zero, that'll take you directly to the main line. And uh, it would, again, be our honor and privilege to be able to serve and uh, uh, pray for you as well. And so I pray that the Lord will bless all of us today as we spend some time in his word and we spend time with one another. Uh, today, uh, as before we do our meet and greet, I just want to remind you, if you're uncomfortable shaking hands, it's okay. Uh, we can do a, a, a wave or a, an elbow bump, or uh, if you're more comfortable and would like to do a hug, that's okay too. But uh, it's our opportunity to introduce ourselves to other one, one, others that are around us, and if there's somebody new, uh, to introduce ourselves to somebody new that we haven't seen for a while or maybe haven't seen before. So let's begin our worship by rising and greeting each other with the peace of our Lord Jesus.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That we may enter into the holy presence of Christ, let us confess our sins, that we may be made the righteousness of God. We confess to you, Almighty God, our blindness to your glory, and our reluctance to seek your grace. We have sinned against you and our neighbors by our own fault, in both our thoughts and actions, as well as the good we have failed to do. For the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, forgive us, renew our hearts, enliven us in spirit, and let us see your glorious we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the dawn dies, uh, the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your hearts. In the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Exalt the Lord, o our God, and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. The Lord reigns. Let all the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, and comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
O oh God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first reading is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. For we did not follow clearly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice that was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on that holy mountain. And we, were, and we have something more sure, prophetic word, to which we will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star shines in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God, and they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared with, to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. At this point, we'd like to invite the children to come forward for the sharing of the children's message. Well, good morning. Good morning. So this this wouldn't have gone over super great or as easily when I was in Florida. But how many of you have ever hiked up a mountain? Nice. Now in, in Florida, the tallest mountain between Cocoa Beach and Orlando was, what was it? 
It was the garbage dump. <laughs> As there are no hills in Florida, uh, or at least between. So you've climbed a mountain, right? You ever gone on a sweet hike? Gone all the way up to the top of Castle Rock over at South Table Mountain? You haven't done that one yet? Oh man, it's so easy a Charlie could do it. Isn't that right? So not too long ago, it feels like forever ago, I took a hike with my three favorite hiking friends. And I have two of them here. Yeah, you and your sister, and who else? No, it was mom. It was mom. But I love to go hiking and go on the fun places, and I always took my three, now my four favorite, hiking partners to go with me. Now, Jesus, he had his three favorite disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he took them everywhere. He went on special retreats with them. He went on special hikes with them. And in today's gospel reading, he did that too. He took them up, just Jesus, Peter, James, and John, all the way up to the top of a mountain. And he did it for a nice little retreat. Now things are going to be happening in Jesus' life pretty quickly uh, after this reading, and for us here in this church, it starts on Wednesday, reminder, uh, Ash Wednesday. So Jesus is preparing his last journey to the cross. And, and when you go to the mountaintop, is it typically, is it beautiful and you can see forever? And you can see the sun rise and the sun set when you're on the top of a mountain. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Now, when you're down in the valley, is that pretty easy to see, too? No, when you're down in the valley, it's a lot darker. The sun rises later. The sun sets way earlier. You're like, oh, man, it's 3 o'clock and there's no more sun. I should probably head back east when I'm in the mountains. And then, oh, there's the traffic. We don't want to talk about the traffic. But it's cool, too, because Jesus is preparing for all these things, and he, he goes to the top of the mountain with his three best friends. And all of a sudden, there's two new people that just show up. And, and Peter, James, and John, they're like, oh, my goodness! Not only is there two new people, but Jesus' clothes, they change. I, I kind of prepared for this. They, he, they went from like a, like a dark gray or a, a brown or something, and then all of a sudden he had like white clothes on. Oh man, this could be cleaner. <laughs> OxyClean uh, is what I should use. But Jesus' clothes went bright white like lightning, and he looked amazing. He showed his friends, Peter, James, and John, that he is God through this this amazing transfiguration. Elijah and Moses showed up, and this is amazing because Elijah and Moses are the ones who are the, the, okay, Moses, then Elijah, the law, then the prophets, like the two big guys in the Old Testament. Like, Moses was the guy who helped the people of Israel out of captivity, across the, the Red Sea on dry land, 10 commandments, wandered for 40 years in the desert, put up with the people of Israel who complained every single day like a parent of millions. <laughs> and then there was Elijah who was there with him too. Elijah was so cool. It was, he's the guy who, who uh, showed the people of Israel against the prophets of Baal that God is the true God and he had amazing things in his story too. And, and the law and the prophets, Moses, Elijah, they were hanging out with Jesus on the top of the mountain and it was the coolest thing ever. Peter was scared. <gasps> it's a good thing we're here. Baby, we should make some tents. And then all of a sudden, they're afraid, and they bow down, and they look up, and then there's nobody there. But Jesus. But more importantly, before they get scared and they bow down, they hear the voice of God saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. God is telling Peter, James, and John that Jesus is his son, his beloved son, and they are to listen to him, and we hear those words too. This Jesus is 
God's Son. Listen to him. And the most amazing words that we hear, actually we're going to be hearing after the sermon, is pastor talking about communion, take and eat. This is my body given for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for your forgiveness. We hear these amazing words from Jesus saying, you are loved, you are forgiven. Take these words, not just from the mountaintops, but down into the valleys. So when you go on your next hike and you go all the way up to, to the top of Castle Rock on South Table Mountain, by the way, it's a very easy hike. It's doable by a three-year-old. You can do it. You can see so far, and it's so cool. But we hear and we remember these words on the mountaintop that Jesus is God's son, and then when we're in the valleys where it's dark, we can remember that Jesus is God's son, loves us, and forgives us. So with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. For your son Jesus Jesus. help us us. to listen to him him. and to remember remember. his words of love love. and the forgiveness of our sins sins. in Jesus name we pray pray. Amen. amen So today, as I begin the message, I'm going to do something a little bit out of the ordinary. I'm going to ask you a question. Well, I guess that isn't so out of the ordinary. I ask a lot of questions up here, don't I? What I'm going to ask today, though, is that you uh, answer the question, all right? So what I'd like you to do is is, uh, uh, talk about a question with your partner, uh, somebody near you, all right? And I see a few people that are by yourself. You have my permission to move. All right, and talk with somebody close by. Uh, But the question is, if you could choose one event from Jesus' life where you could be present and to see it for yourself, which would you choose? Which event would you choose if you could choose an event to be with Jesus during the course of his life? All right, share that with a partner.
And now I'm going to ask a few of you, uh, uh, a couple of you, whether you would share which, which uh, event you would choose. Are there any volunteers? An event that you would, would choose? Okay, Bobby, we're going to start with you. All right, what, what event would you choose? After the crucifixion of Jesus. Okay, so she said the resurrection, uh, and uh, she would be there. And now why? Why would you like that one? The Holy, yeah, when Jesus appeared to the disciples and said, peace be with you, now receive the Holy Spirit, you would like that. Okay. Uh, Greg, yeah, I saw your hand up. Resurrection. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, crucifixion. The crucifixion. Why would you like to see the crucifixion? Because I'm going to shed blood. And... Okay, because our redemption is through the uh, shedding of his blood. All right, one more. Somebody. All right, Connie. Why don't you uh, holler loud and, and I, will, um, I will repeat it. You'd like to see where the Jesus is walking on water. Why? Man, wouldn't it be cool to see the power of God, all right? To see him walking on water. That was one of them that I was listening to for, for myself. Th to be able to see uh, the power of God. Uh, wouldn't it be cool to see the power of God as, as you're uh, witnessing a, 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 one, a great storm on the sea, and then all of a sudden uh, he says, peace be still, and whew, it's still. Wouldn't it be really cool uh, to see Jesus take a little boy's lunch and feed thousands of people with leftovers to boot, all right, and to know that he would provide for us. Wouldn't it be cool to, to see uh, Jesus and, and uh, have them move the tombstone away and then uh, have him holler out, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus, who'd been dead in the tomb for four days, come out alive, a, a dead man made alive. Wouldn't it be cool uh, to be able to, to be uh, there when the shepherds uh, heard the message of the angels declaring Jesus' birth, and then to follow them and go and, and worship him, and to, to be kneel at the manger. Wouldn't it be really cool to see some of that stuff? And when I started thinking about it, I thought, what, why would that be so cool? Well, because there's a part of me sometimes that, that doubts a little bit. Sometimes there's a, a little bit of a skeptic in me. Now that I've made that confession to you, would you like to tell me that that's true for you too, please? <laughs> we, there is a little bit of skeptic in, in all of us. Oh, well, Alan just read a Bible passage, our first reading for today from uh, the book of, uh, of 2 Peter chapter 1. And in this reading, you know, we have uh, Peter writing this letter to some skeptics, some people that doubt it. And what they were doubting was the fact that the resurrection, or excuse me, the, yeah, the resurrection would come, the judgment day would come, that Christ would return. In fact, they were more than skeptics. They were starting to preach this as a fact. The apostles had told about this, and now the apostles were dying. The judgment wasn't coming. And you and I can sometimes, uh, when we look at our lives, we can realize that, you know, sometimes we, we live that way too. That there are days in our lives when we wonder whether the judgment day is ever going to come. Because every day, the sun rises in the east, it goes across, makes its trek across the sky. It uh, sets over the mountains to the west, and we go to sleep, and the next day the same thing happens. Each day we take a page of the calendar off, and each day another page, and then another page, over and over again. The, the earth does its rotation around the sun, and we've got other seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, and then we start over again with winter, spring, summer, and fall, and it does that year after year. Every day, you and I get up, and we do the same kind of thing. We get up, we prepare for the day, we go about our business. Some of us go to school, some of us uh, go to work, some of us have other tasks to do and during the day. At the end of the day, we get ready for bed, we go to bed, next day we wake up and we do the same old thing. And this has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And we begin to wonder if the judgment is ever going to come. And these skeptics were saying that. They were saying, the judgment day is not going to come. 
It's not a reality. And then when you start thinking about it, and they called it a myth, a myth, just like you know, the Greek myths with Zeus and Apollos and Athena and Poseidon. These were things that were fabricated by the, the imaginations of men, and so is this whole Judgment Day thing. It's not going to happen. And when you think about it, if the, res if the judgment's not, I mean, the, the, the day of judgment's not coming, well, then there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, then this is all there is. And if this is all there is, well, then we can just live life the way we will please. Might as well just enjoy what we've got, right? And that was what was going on. And Peter said, no, 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 no. No. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we revealed to you the power and the coming of Jesus Christ. What we told you is a fact. It's true. There is going to be a judgment. There is going to be a day of judgment. And there is a resurrection. Because what we gave to you is absolutely true. And how could he be so sure? He said, because I was an eyewitness. I was there. I was there to witness exactly like Josh was talking with the children. I was there on that mountain. My buddies, John and James, were with me. They could verify this fact. That we got up there and suddenly the divinity of Jesus was made real to us. He, he shone like the sun. We couldn't even look at him. His, his clothing was as white as light, brilliant light. He revealed himself, we saw it with our own eyes, as the Son of God. This is the Jesus who came from heaven to walk on this earth, live a perfect life, to suffer and die on the cross in our stead. He's the one who rose from the dead. He's the one who ascended into heaven. And he's the one who's coming back one day to judge the living and the dead. It's a fact. And not only did we see it with our own eyes, but we heard it with our own ears. It was terrifying. It was awesome and awful all at the same time. When we heard the voice of God declare from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It's a fact, folks. Peter was laying out his credentials. He was an expert witness. He had walked with Jesus for three years. He had observed his miracles. He had heard him teach with authority. He had seen him display his power in, in one way or another through the miracles that he performed and the icing on the cake, the mountaintop experience. The, the crowning achievement was that vision that he had seen on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, now Peter was a man of faith. Six days prior to the Mount of Transfiguration, he was at Caesarea Philippi with Jesus, and Jesus turned to them, and he, and he said, who do people say that I am? And the answers were buried. Uh, some say you're Elijah or some other prophet. Some say you're John the Baptist who came back, and they had a bunch of different answers. And then Jesus said, no, here's a real important question. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, being the, the bold one of the bunch, stood up and he said, you are the Christ, the Savior of the world. You are the Son of God, the Son of the living God. He declared that faith. And you and I do that too every Sunday as we, we say the Apostles or the Nicene Creed. We declare that we are believers in all of that. We declare just as boldly as Peter did. And yet Jesus knew that there was going to come a time when they were going to doubt and they were going to deny him and they were going to run away because he was going to die. And so he gave them this vision, not this vision, but this, this reality on the Mount of Transfiguration revealing himself. And Peter said, you want to know why I know that this isn't a myth? Because I saw it with my own eyes. And you've got something even more compelling. You don't have to just take my word for it. There's something even more convincing. And he called it the prophetic word. Now, he used that term as for a, a reason. He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures. 
And he calls it the prophetic word for, for the reason, the simple reason uh, that um, prophecy is different than a myth. Uh, a myth is created by the imagination of men. It's a fabrication of a man's mind. A prophecy is rooted in history. Peter was telling them there's, there's two reasons why you can look at the Old Testament and, and know that it's, it's valid and that it's true. You can know that those prophecies are true, first of all, because these men were carried by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't their will or their imagination that they were writing down. Those were inspired words of God. That's number one. And the second way we know that, that these prophecies are true is because they are experienced in, in history. They're experienced by mankind in, in reality. And let me illustrate this to you. Matthew is the one that, that was recording our version, the, one, the, the story we read about the transfiguration today. And Matthew was very careful to point out how what was happening with Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament. We go back to Matthew chapter 1, right at the very beginning. Joseph had just found out that his fiance, his betrothed, was expecting a baby. He knew he wasn't the father. He received a, a vision, a, a dream from an angel, and the angel said to him, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus and he will save his people from their sin. And then immediately, Matthew said, this is to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy. A prophecy that had been written by a guy by the name of Isaiah some 700, 750 years prior uh, to Jesus' birth. And Isaiah said, and this will be a sign for you. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This Jesus is that God with us that was conceived by the Holy Spirit and came to this earth. This was proof in the pudding. And then you go to Matthew chapter 2, and we read the story of, of the Magi. Matthew records their uh, coming into Jerusalem and, and search of the, the king of the Jews. And when they asked the question, the Old Testament again was... was uh, referenced. And another prophet by the name of Micah, also 700 years prior to Jesus, gave the answer. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, is not least among the, the rulers of Judah. For from you will come a ruler that will shepherd my people. You see, when they left there and they went to Bethlehem, that was proof that what Micah had, had prophesied 700 years before now was in reality, in history, a true thing. They found Jesus in Bethlehem. Folks, this is two examples out of 10 in the book of Matthew. And I looked it up. There are over 300 Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus. Do you know the mathematical chances of that being coincidence? So many of these couldn't be controlled by mankind. And yet over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament were played out in history, in reality, in the person of Jesus Christ. And that, Peter says, is proof in the pudding. You don't have to take my word for it. Yes. I'm an expert witness. Yes, I'm an eyewitness. Yes, I heard it for myself. But God's prophetic word is brought to you. And you can believe this. And Peter said, this is absolutely true. This Jesus is authentic. He is coming back one day. A day only known by God. A day when he's going to come back and he's going to judge the living and the dead. You can bet on it. And you know what? You can bet your life on it. Why? Because God is good for his word. 
When these prophecies are fulfilled, we know that when God says something, God does it. When he makes a promise, he keeps his word. And if God keeps his word and Jesus is God, then what Jesus said is true and that judgment day is coming. And when we're judged, those of us who are found faithful, those who believe in this Jesus, who depend upon it and trust upon what he accomplished on the cross and the empty grave will be taken to be with him forever. This Jesus is the authentic Christ and he's the savior of the world. And Paul, uh, Peter was adamant about this. So much so, he says, if we look back just a, a couple of, of verses earlier than our text, he said, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life reminding you of this. I'm going to spend the rest of my life reminding you of the truths that I've been teaching you. As few as my days may be, I am not going to ever give up reminding you of this. And there's two reasons. First of all, he wants us to know the truth that Jesus Christ is indeed the authentic Christ. But also he wants us to be authentic Christians, to, to live out our faith. And there's two reasons why we do that. Number one, when we live virtuous lives, when we grow and attempt to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ by spending time in his word, when we uh, live out our lives, it, it keeps us on the right track. When we follow God's word, it gives us direction for our lives. It gives us strength to live despite some of the difficulties we encounter. And it gives us a purpose for living. And I'm going to tell you what a friend of mine told me not too long ago. When we don't follow God's will, we invite chaos into our lives. But when we follow God's will, he gives us that direction and that strength and that purpose. And, and that purpose is the second reason why we want to follow God's will. It's the second reason why Peter wanted to remind them to live virtuous lives, to remain steadfast in his word, uh, to live godly lives. When we share the word of God, we live it out in our lives, it, it, it brings validity to God's word in, a, in this way. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When we live out our faith, when we live virtuous lives, when we seek to know Jesus and live accordingly, it points to Jesus. And other people look at us and go, whoa, they really believe what they preach. And there's one more thought I'd like to share with you. It's kind of a, a hidden thought in all of this. When we read around our text, and we read just before, we realize that, that Peter, the circumstances that are going on in his life is that he's in prison. And why is he in prison? He's in prison because of his faith. Because he was an authentic Christian. And there were people that were opposed to that. He was in prison awaiting his execution. Now let me ask you a question. Would someone be willing to die for something that wasn't absolutely true? Oh, we might say, well, yeah, one deranged or disillusioned man might uh, convince himself of some reality, but let me ask this, would 12 men? There were 11 remaining disciples after Jesus ascended into heaven. And then there was a guy by the name of Paul who was called by Jesus afterward. Those 12 men, every single one of them, was willing to go to the, their death. And 11 of those 12 did die horrendous deaths, martyr deaths, because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Would they do that if this wasn't true? And Peter says, I'm willing to die for this. But my, during my time here, I'm going to continually remind you. I'm going to continually remind you that, that this Jesus is the authentic Christ. And he wants you to be authentic Christians. And those men were willing to be authentic Christians because they knew this Jesus. And folks, you and I know him too. We know him too because of, of this word, this prophetic word that God gives to us that was played out in history. It's real, it's sure, it's certain. 
And now he calls us to be authentic Christians. So may we be renewed in our conviction and in our faith that Jesus is the authentic Christ. And may we live as authentic Christians, sharing and living out that faith so that others may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. And now, let's rise and let's declare our confession of faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you sent your son Jesus to be our savior. We thank and praise you that in your word you gave us glimpses of, of who you are through Jesus, your son. That he came to reveal your heart and your character, your promise and your um, future promise that you give to us. Lord, may we be sure and certain in our faith through the reading of your word that, that we are indeed worshiping and praising and following an authentic Christ. And Lord, we pray that by the power of your spirit that you would enable us and strengthen us and guide us and direct us uh, to be authentic Christians, not only for our own strength and our own goodwill, but also, Lord, for the good of others, that others may come to know you through us. Dear Lord, we pray that the offerings that we will be bringing forward here to the altar that they would be blessed by you, that they would be a reflection of our conviction and our faith in you. And Lord, that you would use those offerings to uh, reach out with your good word and your will and um, with your sacraments uh, so that others may come to know you as well. Lord, may we be about your business through our offerings and through our actions and through our authentic Christianity to reach our community with Christ. Lord, we pray for our world, and especially, Lord, today we continue to lift up you, uh, Turkey and Ukraine, and for those that are affected by the chemical spill in Ohio. Lord, there are so many tragedies, so many uh, catastrophes in our world, uh, so many hurts and so much pain. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, be the Lord of this world, and Lord, that you would use us once again to be authentic Christians as we reach out with your love wherever we may be. May your church be salt and light to the world around us. And Lord, we pray a prayers of thanksgiving for our board of elders and their diligence in overseeing worship concerns and the well-being of our staff and our members. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them with wisdom and discernment in their decision-making and may their relationships with staff and the members be a mutual blessing. Lord, we pray for our call committee as they uh, meet once again to decide next steps on the call process. We pray, Lord, that you would give them an extra measure of your wisdom and discernment and that you would guide them with your direction, that they may follow your will and that as we seek to con uh, 
to find that man that you have chosen for our next senior pastor, that it would be directed by you. Dear Lord, we pray for prayers of thanksgiving and, and also prayers of healing. We pray for those with ongoing health concerns, those on our prayer page, those that we name upon our heart, those that are struggling with mental or um, depression, mental illness or depression. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray for those that are struggling with uh, respiratory illnesses. And especially today, we lift up Tom Miniman and Margaret Ziegler, John Carlson, Alois Bolton, Barb Shuckman, Ron Shuckman, Reagan Gadini, Mike Cardinelli, Marlene Peck, and all who are suffering re with respiratory illnesses. Again, Lord, we pray that you would lay your healing hand upon them, that you would comfort them with your presence and give them your strength. And today, Lord, we would like to ask for your comfort and peace for Carl Nagy at the death of his father, Arnold, who passed away this morning. Lord, we pray that you would uh, surround Carl and his family with your peace and your comfort and the assurance of your presence. But most importantly, Lord, remind him of the assurance of our salvation through Jesus, your son. And Lord, we thank you that he is the authentic Christ. And Lord, may we, as authentic Christians, surround those who are hurting. Lord, all these prayers we lift before you, together with those that we've left unspoken, we ask that you would answer them according to your will and your wisdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, a meet. Uh, right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has transfigured, who was, who at his transfiguration revealed his glory to his disciples, that they might be strengthened to proclaim his cross and resurrection, and with all the faithful look forward to the glory of life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Lord, teach us the prayer that your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now, my friends, may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you all, keeping you firm in the faith from now until the day that we meet him face to face. Depart in his peace and his jo joy. Amen. As we uh, conclude our service, we have a few video announcements we'd like to share with you about the mission and ministry here at Peace. Good morning, everybody. Today, the library is hosting their annual event called For the Love of Books. So stop by for contests, treats, and get to know all the amazing resources that are in the library for Christian growth and just entertainment right here in our very own library. Wiz Kids meets on Wednesday <laughs> afternoons through April, and they are in need of one more tutor and two more subs. So if you're interested in more information, you can contact Cindy Davis or give us a call in the office. Uh, next, um, there is a new slate of adult classes that begin on March 5th. Uh, in particular, there's a new class called Story Runners that's going to be led by Melissa Erdman in the craft room or the old conference room C. And next Sunday, you'll see an insert in the bulletin that's got a list of all the new classes that are going to be available. Lastly, the Lenten season is upon us, and Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday on the 22nd. And we'll have two identical services, one at 4.30 and the second one at 6 p.m. And then following, or you might want to come a little early because the imposition of ashes will start about 10 minutes before the service starts. And then all Wednesdays in March will be our regular midweek Lenten services at 4.45 here in the sanctuary and at 6 p.m. in the community room for roundtable worship. We'll see you there. Good. Repeat. And now receive the benediction of the Lord. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you all and give you his peace. Amen. On this day, alleluias are sung for the last time in the church until the resurrection of our Lord. Alleluia is not heard during the season of Lent as we turn in penitence to the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ to be renewed by our baptismal faith. Through our, uh, through every, though every Sunday is a little Easter, we restrain our praise until Easter Sunday with all of Christendom uh, joins in singing alleluias to our King. Let us now raise our voice in song as we anticipate not only our coming Easter celebration, but the ultimate feast of victory when we shall sing Alleluia with the saints and angels, cherubim and seraphim, 
Moses and Elijah, apostles, martyrs, prophets, and all the company of heaven before the Lamb on his throne. So as we begin our season of Lent, we won't be hearing Alleluia for the next seven weeks until Easter Sunday. May God bless your Lenten season. Amen.